I think it's safe to say that Dennis Wheatley is a phenomenon. And I'll put this out there first. I don't like all of his books. Um, I am more interested in his occult and horror books. Um, he wrote a lot of um, series. He's kept the same characters going. And they're not really my cup of tea. So the uh, the Roger Brook ones are set during the French Revolution. The Gregory Sallust ones are set during the Second World War. I think Wheatley probably took a lot of his own experiences and put those into those books. Uh, the Julian Day novels are kind of espionage. Precursor to 007, really. The ones I love are the Duke de Richelieu stories. Um he was just he, i think those those books that character is Dennis Wheatley fighting against the forces of the occult um those were some of the ones that were made into films amongst others Dennis Wheatley started writing in the 30s and his books have remained in print pretty much up to the present day and during the late 60s early 70s his books were selling up to a million a year, which is just staggering. A lot of his characters are very conservative, just like Wheatley was. And his books, I'm trying to say it nicely, his books are very ploddy. They, they're not fast-paced, they're not gory, they're not kind of titillation books. But there's something so cosy and just just lovely about reading The Satanist or something like that. Now, Wheatley was always interested in the occult. He knew Crowley, Montague Summers, uh, Rollo Ahmed, Harry Price, people that figured... Uh, quite prominently in 20th century esoteric thought. So in 1971, Dennis Wheatley wrote a book called The Devil and All His Works, which was a study of uh, black magic, Satanism, folk magic, uh, Eastern thought, Western thought, anything that was uh, kind of a, considered to be some kind of a cult. And it did very well. So his next step in 1974 was to work with uh, George Rainbird, who uh, was the chairman of Sphere Books, to publish the Dennis Wheatley Library of the Occult, which, which was a collection of uh, hand-picked titles by Mr Wheatley himself, uh, some would be occult fiction. Some would just be supernatural fiction, actually. Some would be uh, factual books. Um, Dennis Wheatley had got about 400 books under consideration for the, uh, for the series. It actually ran to 45, stopping in 1977 when Wheatley died. Each book would have an introduction written by Dennis Wheatley um, and they'd be normally published at two a month although the first uh, month that they were released which was May 1974 um, the list included six books. It sounds awesome but the series did have some downsides. Um, one thing was a lot of the authors that they they decided on was still fairly easy to find and currently in print. Uh, Bram Stoker, H.G. Uh, Wells, Lord Dunsany, even stuff like uh, Carl Jung, uh, Montague Summers' stuff was still in print. Yes, they did reprint some, some rare or more obscure novels, and it's a really good way to get hold of some hard, harder-to-find novels. Um, another downside was Wheatley's introductions now Dennis Wheatley by this point in 1974 he'd sold an estimated 33 million copies of his books which is staggering 
And I'm not disputing his credentials as a writer. But he couldn't write introductions to other people's books. So this is from uh, The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell, which is a brilliant novel. And I'm sorry it does contain spoilers, but I want to give you an example of how Wheatley ruined <laughs> the books in his introductions. So he, he talks a little bit about Elliot O'Donnell and then talks about the book itself. It starts in San Francisco during the great slump of the early 1930s. Three clerks have been turned off and out of work for weeks. One of them, Leon Hamar, accidentally damages a book and is forced into buying it. To his disgust, he finds it's on Atlantean magic. He reads passages of it with the utmost scepticism. But the three friends are literally starving, so it's a case of, let's try anything once. After a week or so, performing preparatory acts laid down in the book and passing various tests, they go from San Francisco by night to Muir Woods, a national reserve. There the three perform an Atlantean magical operation. To their amazement and terror it calls up a demon with whom they enter a pact. During each three-month period for the following 21 months they will be given for three months only certain supernatural powers. If during the whole period they live together in harmony and none of them marry, at the end of the 21 months all the powers granted to them during the seven three-month periods will be theirs for the rest of their lives. The powers given to them during these three periods include divination, thought reading, leaving one's body, making oneself invisible, being able to breathe underwater, taming wild beasts and understanding their language, inflicting diseases, creating plagues of insects, curing any ailment, transforming humans into vampires or werewolves, complete domination over women's affections, mm, and numerous other manifestations achievable only by invisible influences. The major interest of the story, therefore, lies in the use that can be made of these magical powers bestowed by Satan and the difference of the natures of the three men who form the Sorcery Club. Naturally, they grow rich. Then, finding San Francisco too small for their operations, they move to London. There, among other activities, they give performances as conjurers and are able to perform such fantastic tricks. They nearly bankrupt Maskylan and Devant but they can make use of each occult power, such as becoming invisible for only three months, and for infringing the law they are still liable to arrest by the police. But by far the worst danger they are up against is failure to fulfil the condition of maintaining the harmony between them, and their leader, Leon Hamer, is faced with a terrible task, for one of his companions is a confirmed drunkard, and the other ungovernably attracted to women. This is a struggle between mental weakness due to physical desires and the wiles of Satan that is a high spot of this intriguing story. Yeah, so thanks, Dennis, but spoilers, mate. <laughs> and he does this in a lot of the introductions for the fiction releases in the library. He just basically outlines the plot. Oh, this is other ones. In the introduction to The Devil's Mistress by J.W. Brody Innes, uh, he talks about Dracula um, and says as I remarked in my introduction to it there are many passages in it that are tediously long winded and that English characters are Victorian dummies that have little personality no he, he didn't if you read the introduction to Dracula he says how brilliant and fast paced and wonderful and how much of a classic of fiction it is um, in the introduction to Dark Ways to Death by Peter Saxon, before he goes on to outline the entire novel and spoil everything, he says, I have rarely read a novel, the first chapter of which was more colourless, impersonal, and lacking in inducement to continue. <laughs> he does go on to say it gets better, but it's kind of like, mate, don't, you know, your, your name's on these. Don't, don't diss your own, like, library of the occult. In an interview in uh, Paperback Fanatic number 9, Peter, they interview Peter Tremaine, and he said, because he was published a lot by Sphere, who published the Library of the Cult, 
He says, Dennis didn't have much to do with it except to allow his name on the covers and contribute the briefest of introductions. It was Stan Nichols, I believe, who was Dennis's research assistant for the series. So it seems like um, Stan Nichols would put a list together of possible books that were in the public domain and Dennis Wheatley would uh, pick books that he could pretty much rattle off an introduction to. But it's it's obvious that he knew he knew some of them, but I'm I'm not I'm not being derogatory about this series. There is some brilliant books in this series, and the covers are up to, up to a point. The later ones that kind of change the cover design, but the covers are stylish, and they're all the same. So they make a set, which uh, to a collector like me is massively appealing, um, and also some of the. Some of the factual ones are really interesting, and if you're interested in any kind of occult thought, then there there is some really interesting factual books in there. The fiction, the novels, is and the anthologies. That's a little bit more hit and miss. Um, the anthologies aren't particularly inspired. There was stuff like Dracula and Frankenstein and Faust that that has been reprinted thousands and thousands of times throughout the world. But what's really nice is when you start collecting it as a set, there are books, or there's books that I wasn't previously aware of, that have turned into favourites of mine, that I've discovered through the Library of the Occult, and then gone on to treat myself to nice uh, hardcover early editions of. Some of the ones that I've got, that I've picked up fairly reasonably look like uh, remainder stock that are absolutely pristine. Um, so if some were remaindered, maybe it would suggest that the sales weren't staggering. But overall, I mean, it's a heck of an undertaking. Um, and it would have been interesting to see how it did progress. Some of the later ones are pretty cool novels that are hard to find. Um, and it's... It's it's just a fun series to collect. So yeah, that's uh, if you fancy getting into collecting the Library of the Cult, some are going to be a bit more pricey, but there's a lot that you can get fairly reasonably priced. Uh, so that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, leave us a like, subscribe to my channel. I'm going to, as you've probably seen, I'm just going to keep producing videos about books and nostalgic horror things that appeal to me. In the meantime, thank you for watching.